Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. It's episode 108. It's October 15th, 2018. And I'm forgetting how to podcast. Uh, you're listening to, or maybe even watching, Human Factors Cast. Welcome to the show, everybody. My name's Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Blake Arnsdorf. Blake, it's, uh, you know, we, we have a lot to talk about today. We got California banning the default passwords on any internet-connected device. All of them. All of them. Uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation has updates on autonomous car rules. <gasps> I know. Introducing an intelligent intersection from the traffic transportation research board. And then we're also going to talk about the font that helps you remember. So we got a lot of fun stuff to talk about. But first, I want to jump into some programming notes before we get into uh, some of the more fun things. Um, so first off, welcome, new listeners. We usually pick up a lot of you after HFES. So sincerely, welcome to the show. We're happy to have you. This is our weekly podcast where we talk about human factors. Glad to have you. Uh, <laughs> and a special, special thank you to all of our guests from HFES 2018. If you haven't had a chance, uh, please go check out some of those interviews. We talked to some amazing folks uh, over the course of that week. It was a crazy week. It was a busy week. How many did we end up doing? Like 20? I think we 20, had... 21? I think we had 20 in total. Whew. That's uh, a lot of interviews. There's a lot of fun, though. 20 or 19. One of, the, one of those two. There's a lot of interviews uh, over a, a, only a condensed four days, um, but it was, it was a ton of fun. And uh, you know what? We want to know what you guys think. So I am using the top of the show here to plug this uh, audience survey. So we have a link in this description, and uh, we basically want to figure out how we can improve coverage of these events because I know it's super important. Uh, if you can't make it, you are out of the conference and and you don't know what's going on and uh you know one thing that we've found is helpful is doing this coverage of these events and again we're just kind of uh trying to solicit some feedback from you guys we're unpaid we're, we do all these uh just from the from the bottom of our hearts um you know it, it's all good but honestly it's only seven quick questions takes about three minutes of your time asks you which interviews you liked which ones you didn't like why you liked them why you didn't like them and uh you know, how does this compare to some of our other coverage and, and help us out? I mean, sincerely, all the feedback, you know this. It's user research. It all goes back to you guys. So, uh, yeah, check that out. Hey, Blake, did Nick. you know we're on Spotify? We are. We are Spotifying now. How's that feel? Uh, feels good. We're on Spotify. We're on YouTube. Uh, go check us out on YouTube. Uh, like and subscribe. I'm going to say it every week until we get 100 subs. So that way we can get change, that name. Change our slash name. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it's not too soon to be looking forward to uh, some more events. We got HFES Australia coming coming right around the corner. That's next month. I'm uh, talking with our field correspondent, Mateo. Uh, he's going to be out there in Perth, Australia. Most definitely. Uh, trying to get some coverage from the event down there. We also have, uh, you know, never too soon to start looking forward to Healthcare Symposium, IEEE, CHI. Those are all next year, but, you know, get your tickets early, uh, get your plane tickets early, get all the tickets early. Yeah, because all of them do, like, pre-sales and stuff like that for early bird attendance and all that kind of good stuff. So it mm. is, there's no time like the present to start looking into conferences you want to go to in 2019. Yeah, go check those out. Blake, it's been, like, three weeks since we had some banter What's been going on in your life? Oh, my goodness. So, Nick, uh, something I like to do in my free time is, like, put different videos together, like, create edits and stuff like that. And something that I was playing around with over the weekend, I couldn't even believe that they were going to launch. But they had put, like, a beta test out for basically Premiere Pro so that you could edit video from your phone. And I couldn't – I hadn't really thought that that would be something that would be easy to do. But even though it's pretty – it's a little bit clunky and there's, like, there's some hard – hard parts about like using basically a very small screen with your two fingers to try and like edit clips together. It's pretty phenomenal what Adobe was able to do through a, like an iPhone app. Do you have like a video we can throw up for B roll? Uh, yeah, I do. Oh, excellent. Yeah. I want to see what you created, man. Yeah. It's, it's some silly coffee videos, but yeah, I mean it was, it was a trip to me that you were able to basically like load in any clips from your phone, cut them up, like shift them around in the timeline, however you wanted to, and then add music like probably in about like 10 minutes. And it's it's super easy. It's it's one of the easiest experiences I've ever had through an Adobe app, especially. Okay, maybe maybe we got to tell Jeff about this. He can edit our videos through. Yeah, his he phone. just like <laughs> cut it up on his phone <laughs> instead of having to worry about all the video stuff we send him. But yeah, it was yeah. Uh, that was been pretty fun, and I've been so like looking at different things coming out of Adobe Max. So there's gonna be a bunch of different iPhone apps coming out for like Photoshop that are a little more 
a little more, uh, I don't know, have some of those like harder features or some of the more ex- awesome features you get on a desktop, and now they're moving into mobile. So it's cool. Well, that is cool. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to talk about. Well, you've got one kind of heavy hitter <laughs> on here to talk about. <laughs> I mean, how could I forget? Uh, finally, Snapchat has cat filters. Snapcat. So, so what? Okay, I don't really <laughs> use Snapchat. So tell I don't me either. What, tell me a little bit about what this is. So look, my partner was uh, was playing around on Snapchat, and she said, "Oh, look, there's there's filters for our cats now." And uh, if you've been a long time listener of the show, or I guess in the last couple of weeks, uh, we've been doing Cat Watch because we have a third cat in the house now, and uh, still not going well. Um, <laughs> even like, yeah, it's That's bad. So, bad. so uh, but but at least we get. You know, some comfort knowing that Snapchat has cat filters. <laughs> so it, you said it's like a filter for your cat. It doesn't make you look like a cat. It's, no, no, no. So no, it's filters for your cat. You know how like the the Snapchat and the the Facebook Messenger have the uh, the face recognition. Yeah, they do that for cats now. Oh my goodness! So they recognize cats, and you can do like the the watermelon over the head. Yes, that's hilarious. So, so now, yeah, now they're doing it. To There's animals. a couple good ones, but honestly, I want to talk about this other piece of banter that I failed to put in the show notes, but also want to talk about. Um, there's this podcast called Human Factors Cast, and let me tell you, look, I don't want this to be like, uh, you know, tooting our own horn here, but honestly, but he's gonna do it. Honestly, look. So last week, or I guess it was two weeks ago now at HFES, I, I'll be honest, when we were interviewing. I was very focused on like the conversation in the sense of, okay, how am I going to, what, what question am I going to ask next? Like what question would our listeners want to listen to? Uh, what would make for an engaging conversation? And that was my whole goal. And so for a lot of these interviews, I didn't actually sort of process the content. So over the last two weeks, I've been busy listening back to every single interview that we did and there's some audio errors. I'll apologize for those now. Um, but, you know, uh, like like our outro or intro played as an outro one time, I think, during uh, Peter and Gabby. And I made, it for, made a little bit of fun. That's okay. In the middle of those episodes. But the point is, like, I I uh, was so focused during these things that I didn't absorb the content. And it's uh, it was so nice to have sort of this, this um, repository of interviews to go back and listen to. And uh, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed all of the ones that we did. Yeah, I didn't have any kind of qualms with any of the ones we had. And it, and it was one of those things that, for most of it, I really had to go back and listen to things like the, the Peter Hancock one or go back and listen to the Nancy Cook episode because, it, it, I don't know, like you said, I was not processing during the moment. Yes. It was more of, like, let's actively think about what could be next or what, I don't know, where they're going to go with the conversation. Are they going to get off the rails, whatever it may be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but that's that's all the banter I have. I don't know. You good? I'm good. Let's <laughs> okay. get it. Well, you know what, you guys? It's been a couple weeks since we've done that, this thing that we're doing right now. But, Blake, do you know what we're doing? Uh, I think we're talking about cat videos. Yeah, that's right. Cat videos. It's Human Factors News. <laughs> this is part of the show all about Human Factors. This is where we talk about everything related to the field of Human Factors coming out of the Human Factors field. Uh, about human factors. This could be anything from, we got some transportation in there this week, automation, design, cybersecurity, you name it. As long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is fair game for us to talk about here on the show. Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right. So first up this week, California is banning default passwords for any any internet device that's connected to the internet. Pause for effect. I know. I'm I'm actually freaking out. I thought they'd already done it. But all right. So in two years, anything, any device that... that is produced or sold in California that can connect to the internet will come with a unique password. The Information Privacy Connected Devices Bill that comes into effect on January 1st, 2020 effectively bans pre-installed or hard-coded, or hard-coded default passwords. So the law is aimed at stopping the spread of botnets made up of compromised network devices such as routers, smartwatches, or even security cameras and other IoT equipment. So malicious software can often take control of these types of devices by trying to easy to guess or publicly diagnose default login credentials. The new regulation mandates device manufacturers to either create a unique password for each device at the time of reduction or require the user to create one they one the first time they interact with the device for the very first time. <laughs> so, Nick, this is... Okay, when I read this title, I thought it was already in place and it didn't really shock me. 
and I and I, I don't really know why I thought that this was already going on, but do, I mean, do you change and make? Have you ever come across a default password? Because oh, I don't think I have. Yeah, yeah. Netgear one or whatever it is. Like there are default passwords for like routers, internet yeah. routers. Yeah. Uh, and so one thing that you brought up here during the little blurb is that malicious software can often take control of devices. Um, but so can, you know, any, any, any average Joe yeah, walking, walking along looking to hack you or whatever and sees, Oh, you're using a net gear router. I know what the default password is for network router. I'm going to try and you'll be surprised. A lot of people actually keep that default password. And so I think what this is saying is that going forward, uh, starting January 1st, 2020, all manufacturers will have to basically, uh, and because California is setting the standard, they can, they're basically setting the trend. So any major manufacturer that distributes in California will have to go through and make it so that there is a unique password that is printed for your device. And this goes for any of them, right? Any Internet of Things equipment, um, routers, smart switches. So this is good news. I've seen uh, these pre-generated passwords for some devices, but this bill will make it mandatory for most all of, of uh, these connected devices. Which probably only helps people out, right? Because I, I think all these pre-generated passwords are typically pretty strong. I mean, they're they're usually, cr- unless we're talking about like the Netgear 1 type of thing. But, right. But like a lot of the like passwords that I've seen that are pre-generated nowadays, like I wouldn't even remember them or come up with them on my own. Yeah, I yeah, so... I think the biggest thing here is that the effect that this is going to have on manufacturing. So now instead of um, shipping with a password for, you know, the, the Netgear one, right? You have that and that's across all of your routers. Now they're going to have to start individualizing these as they ship out. And it's the same thing as a token that, you know, you, you would apply to anything, but it makes it much harder to guess and it improves cybersecurity from a variety of different aspects uh, and and we know cybersecurity is a pretty big topic in human factors, right? The the, the human piece of it, um, and uh, like one of the biggest sort of security risks in cybersecurity is if you think about it, you know, a lot of people don't rename their router, right? You see Netgear One, and that instantly gives away what type of encryption you have, what type of password could be a default, and um, you know uh, lets people into your secure networks even though you think it's secure. So I wonder if things like that also need to be considered along with giving these very, you know, complex passwords that are unique is not just randomly generating the name as well. Yeah. Almost doing something where, well, I don't know. I think the best thing that they could, that software manufacturers or device manufacturers that interact with software could do is make people set up both like unique names and passwords or to the best of their ability anyway. Cause it, I think the pre-generated thing is great. Um, but like you said, if you run into the case where it's the name of the device, maybe, I don't know, I feel like over time, people's ability to kind of guess how the algorithm maybe is working for, let's say, I know we're picking on Netgear, but whoever's router, yeah, maybe over time they can start cracking it. I'm having a hard time thinking of another router right now. <laughs> yeah. That's the one I see most. Motorola, right? there we go. Something Motorola, like that. Motorola One. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It's um, it's good. It's cyber secure. Um. You have the operational definition here of a connect device, right? You want to go over that? Oh, yeah. So I thought that was a great thing to see from this actual information privacy connected devices bill is that they had operationally defined (laughs) what a connected device really means. So a physical object that is capable of connecting to the Internet directly or indirectly, and there's assigned an Internet protocol address, so an IP address, or a Bluetooth address. So that's interesting. That's Bluetooth devices, too. So my Fitbit now is encapsulated in this definition. Because it will have a unique Bluetooth device, and it connects indirectly to the Internet. It pushes information on my phone, which pushes it up through the Fitbit service. Yeah, definitely. So I I wonder if that means – so would you need to design some sort of – or have some kind of password for your Fitbit then? I don't know how that works. I'm not sure either because that's Um, like an indirect connection through Bluetooth to your phone, which is encompassed in here, but the why is something I'm not sure of. Yeah, that's that opens up a whole another realm of uh, potential complications, right? Like if, um, yeah, if you have these Bluetooth devices that you're just using to control like the the playback functions on your 
music, you know, uh, do you need a password on that? And, and, uh, I know you can assign like pairing passwords, right. And, yeah. and choose it to like auto accept every time. Sure. Um, so maybe I mean, that's a way around it. Yeah. And I don't know, like there's, there's especially, at least in the defense industry, there's a, a lot of pushback about these connected Bluetooth devices, um, at, at least in secret spaces too. I mean, we can talk about, there's, you can't go into a secret space with, uh, one of these connected Bluetooth devices even because the chances are that it can connect to your phone outside of the room and uh, send information from inside, even though that's not the primary function. Um, like we saw the, the Stravia, was it Stravia that, that released all that uh, yeah, anonymized information that yeah, gave right. away military bases, even though they weren't wearing them in secret spaces. Like, yeah, it's one of those things that also, too, it's the same thing with your phone when you put it into, like, you know, airplane mode or same thing with even your Bluetooth devices. They're always transmitting. Right. Like, the, there was a podcast I listened to recently about EMF and the fact that it, it's probably... EMF. A, yeah. Electromagnetic frequency. Yeah. So, like, the, the problem being... Yeah, I almost forgot it, what it stood for, and then you put me on the spot. I was freaking out for a moment. What is it? What does it do? <laughs> but it, I didn't realize that even like having stuff close to you sometimes like that can be. It's still transmitting all the time, even in airplane mode. Yeah, like yeah. I mean, and it's it's. Well, I don't know. Is it is it only is it transmitting or is it receiving? Right, because you can turn off the transmitting functions, right? And I think that's why they have you turn on airplane mode when you're on the uh, uh, on airplanes or whatever. But I think it can always receive, right? So it can always receive geopositional data because it's um, getting information from where you're... I might be wrong about that. I don't know. There's passive and active sensors um, with those devices. Yeah, you're right. But I think nonetheless, I think this bill... I think they got to think a little bit more about some of these instances of yeah. like d- connected devices because, like, for instance, do I really need to you know, have a password for my Fitbit or for my Bluetooth you know, right. or camera monitor? I don't know. Well, we brought up a lot of good points. Get to work, California. Uh, yeah. All right, what do, we got out. Up, what do we got up next? All right, so the U.S. Department of Transportation has released its latest and greatest set of voluntary guidelines for automated driving systems in a report that builds on the previous versions released over the past two years, all of which Nick and I have talked about for the past two years. So providing, preparing, the Preparing for Future Transportation of Automated Vehicles outlines additional safety principles, updates policy, and offers guidance of state and local governments. The Department of Transportation Secretary Elaine Chow actually stated that the integration of automation across transportation systems has the potential to increase productivity and facilitate freight movement. But also, maybe even more importantly, automation has the potential to impact safety significantly by reducing crashes caused by human error, including crashes involved in, involving impaired or distracted drivers and hopefully saving lives. So that's kind of a really big statement coming out of the Department of Transportation as it relates to the kind of their guidelines they're trying to put forth and continually updating as it as they kind of try and get automated vehicles more fielded out in the world. So Nick, what does this really mean for you or what do you think of all of this? I don't know. There's this like pie in the sky version of automated vehicles and having this connected environment where one vehicle is talking to another to optimize routes um i think it's great that they're coming out with this report that says basically that they're outlining their their uh the future right um which is good i it's a matter of how this drives the industry to react to this report and i'm not quite sure what this report offers in the way of um like it's not a bill it's not going to you know, require by law that that autonomous vehicle companies adhere to these. Um, but it sounds like, I don't know, it's, it sounds like this is kind of like our vision uh, and and uh, using these, uh, th- these assessments that they suggest here. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny because I I don't know how to feel about it myself. So there there's kind of a, a dichotomous thing going on here. So the Department of of Transportation is very staunch that they're they're doing their best and putting their best foot forward to try and facilitate getting automated vehicles on the road in various industries and also hopefully save people's lives at the end of the day. But there are some proponents that think that this kind of almost hands off approach that the DOT is taking, which they are. Because, I mean, a lot of the stuff they're talking about, they even mention it in the name of the document. It's voluntary guidance for these autonomous vehicle companies. Yeah. Um, and I think that's an effort to to hopefully not stifle the innovation or, like, stifle the space and hopefully get us 
vehicles that work together in tandem, like Division mentions, a lot quicker. But people are worried. I mean, like what we've experienced over the last year with Uber striking and killing someone. Uh, I mean, it has a lot of people out outside of maybe the tech space a little concerned about what this actually means. And then we're also having to worry about the fact that, yes, we can test autonomous vehicles and get them working in tandem with each other. But what happens when we're integrating it into a system that's not perfect for them? So think of a world where we've got only an X number of autonomous vehicles and everybody else is still driving their car. Yeah, I think it comes down to that all or nothing kind of approach, right? If every if everything's connected, then that's great. It'll work great. Um, and there's only so much benefit that you can have by having partial connectivity amongst all vehicles, right? I, I mean, it, let's say there's some obstruction in the road, right? Someone is not going to know about that. One car not knowing about that could cause a bottleneck for, you know, 10, 20 cars behind them. But if that one car is removed from the equation, then all cars are aware of it and they can adjust accordingly. They can reduce their speed in tandem. They can move over to the left lane in tandem. They can approach the hazard at, at in tandem uh, without actually, uh, you know, and communicating through sensors uh, with each other. And it just, to me, it's it's an all or nothing approach. And then you also have this, I'm going to bring up this other issue, which is uh, proprietary data. How many of these autonomous vehicle companies, Tesla, Ford, um, BMW now, what else? There's a couple other ones. Toyota. Out there. Toyota. So all of them are going to want to hold on to their data as tightly as they can because that's theirs. They collected it with their sensors and even, and you agreed to it with your terms of use. Why would they want to share that with another car company when they want to be the dominant car on the road um so there's that whole issue because what will happen is uh you'll have tesla sharing with tesla toyota sharing with toyota but what if a toyota runs into a problem that there's five teslas following them they're not going to share that information with them and unless there's legislation that's passed and and suggests that hey everyone has to communicate to maximize efficiency on the road yeah, and right now they're taking such a hands-off approach just to get the cars out there, Yeah, I think, from from a lot of different companies. I don't think it's almost focused on some of the big names we're talking about either. I think a lot of just technology in general that are trying to roll into cars is what, what they're trying to stop like putting too many hands on. But you're right. I mean, what happens if you get all these cars out on the road and they only talk to each other's model? I think that's the that is probably the best time for the government department government or state government to put in some kind of regulations is like, hey, your sensors have to at least communicate with, you know, Tesla sensors, talking to Toyotas, talking to BMW, or else we've just created not the same problem, but a different problem. Now we've got, like, let's say, like, sex of autonomous vehicles that can talk to each other, mm-hmm. and then <laughs> you're worrying about those not communicating with people that are actually still driving their cars. Yeah, it almost feels like, uh, the, uh, well... I'm I'm going to bite my tongue on that one. It feels like there there needs to be some sort of central repository for this information that then gets disseminated out as kind of like a third party like a government organization almost that that collects all this data and then aggregates it and feeds it back. So that way all the data from these companies are kind of kept anonymous um and they still have that data. And they can collect data from others, but it's aggregated data. It's not the specific sensor information that this central repository is getting. I don't know. That's just an idea. Um, uh, yeah, I've always I've kind of <laughs> wondered recently if uh, if it's possible to like tr- to just try keeping people in the loop of how of like whether they're driving the car or not, because it does make a distinction between the operator and the driver now. So there's not so much like worrying about right. like the human has to be driving the car. It's like whatever's operating the car. Um, but I was, I've, I've thought about a couple times if Waze or some app like it would be a way to keep people that are in autonomous cars engaged. And also maybe that's a way that the data can get transmitted from, you know, an autonomous vehicle to potentially somebody who's driving a non-autonomous vehicle that, that uses an application sure, like Waze. Yeah. Um, but again, that, that all depends on like, do we really want people getting more distracted in their cars that actually are driving something that doesn't have any automation in it by using, you know, like any kind of navigation product or whatever it may be. Yeah. And by using ways, you're favoring 
some company, some corporation over others. Right? Yeah, and that's just You're, an example because that's the only one I know that's very interactive. No, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but I mean, it almost feels like all these companies need to tap into the same source that is like that repository, right, of information, uh, like a database that is owned by the government. Like, you know, like uh, all these weather services, they tap into um, NOAA. Yeah. You know? And and uh, obviously, everyone has their own sensors, but NOAA has data that everyone can pull from. Um, and so something like that could help. But then you have issues with streamlining. How does that data get fed out to others? And uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I've wondered <laughs> if like, you know how you, or at least you could do this in California. You can get your kind of e-vehicle registered and you get the special, like I can get in the HOV lane stickers. I wonder if by registering your car in a specific way, if it's an older model, if you could get like the state to sponsor sensors for your car that allows you to interact with all these other vehicles on the road. That's a good idea. I, I feel like, like that. Fun. Yeah. yeah. Cause it, yeah, I don't know. Give somebody like me who's got a car from 2002 an opportunity to, you know, I don't know, have some tax break or whatever it may be some incentive to put sensors on my car so that it makes sure. driving with autonomous vehicles safer. And I, this might be getting too off the rails. Um, but I know there are some companies out there, some startups or whatever that are looking at, sort of retrofitting current vehicles with the ability to be autonomous where you basically, or, or semi-autonomous where like you mount your phone in a certain way on your dash and it uses the camera to maintain lane control with a, with a third, you know, kind of thing that goes over your steering wheel. Sure. Which is cool. But that, that information is, um, it's just, it's just camera data. So, you know, that's, it's still some level of autonomy, but how does that interplay with all the other sensor data and, and all these other autonomous vehicles out on the road? I just, I just don't know. There's too many, um, too many things up for, I'd love to talk to somebody that works in one of these car companies to to better understand like the sensor information and how it's kind of all, how all the inner workings really come together. Cause I'm, I'm assuming like startups like that, they must be talking to those kinds of people to try and see like, what would it really take for me to retrofit a car maybe. that could either like be autonomous on its own, or maybe more importantly, in my, my opinion, be seen by autonomous vehicles and understood easily. Yeah. I know in the case of like lane control, it's, it's kind of a closed loop system, right? You have, you have a, a some sort of computer software that these, this startup has developed that, um, looks at the the lanes and and kind of figures out how far left and how far right you are of the center of these lanes and adjusts the steer, steering wheel accordingly. Yeah, it's a, it's a PID loop. Sure, um, I forget what the PID stands for. It's like a PID, PID, um, intensity duration. Uh, I forget P. Anyway, um, that's that. You have anything else on autonomous cars? No, we've ran that one to death. But okay, it was fun. Uh, we got we got more on. Uh, on uh, intelligent intersections uh, right after this though human factors cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week we pack news interviews reviews and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on but we can't do it without you you see the human factors cast network is 100 percent listener supported all the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. That's right, it depends. I want to thank all of our friends this week over at Engadget, uh, the Transportation Research Board, and RMIT University for all of our uh, stories this week. If you want to follow along with all the original articles, we find them as we post them. We post them as we find them, too. <laughs> <laughs> you can join our Slack to links to all these original articles. <laughs> all right, Blake. It's been like three weeks. I forgot how to podcast. What's up next? <laughs> so we are introducing an intelligent intersection. So the Institute of Transportation Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, has re- released a report that seeks to design intelligent intersection infrastructure and evaluate its performance in terms of safety and mobility benefits. This project seeks to remove one important cause of intersection accidents, the human. Uh, that 
is not surprising. So drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists make acts of, make mistakes because they lack sufficient information about the movement of others. And as they produce, as they proceed through an intersection, because there is a spatial and temporal uncertainty. So the report suggests that missing information can be supplied by an intelligent intersection. So the intersection can describe the signals from from all approaches, predict when the signal phase will change, and use sensor data to determine which blind spots are occupied, and then predict red light violators before they actually occur. The intelligent intersection broadcasts this type of information via radio and can be received by a connected vehicle or indeed anyone in the intersection with a smartphone or Bluetooth device, so most intersection users will get this information. The objective of this research is to design intelligent intersection infrastructure and evaluate its performance in terms of safety and mobility benefits. Nick, I can only imagine that if cyclists are actually reading this, they have to be super excited because I, I've seen more than my sh- fair share of nearly near near death cyclists at inter- <laughs> near death cyclist accidents because of people like hopping out on the road or not paying attention to, you know, street signs or whatever it may be. Well, it's been three weeks, Blake, and I, I don't feel so bad because you forgot how to podcast, too. That's uh, <laughs> that's the truth. No, I think this... Okay, so you mentioned cyclists, but I think anyone reading this uh, should be excited about this um, because this can take those sensors that we were just talking about with the autonomous vehicles uh, and feed it back to this centralized system. But more importantly, these are sensors in the environment that everyone can benefit from if it pushes it out to these smartphones, to these connected devices, Um Everyone benefits. Only if you have a unique password. Only if yeah, we're tying it all together. No, but this is great. If you look over this um, this report, it, it comes with uh, various examples of the smart intersections and how it could potentially improve um, safety at these intersections. Because, like it said, you know, a lot of these uh, uh, a lot of these accidents happen because of the human. Right, the human is unaware of what's going on, where their blind spots are. Um, you know what? What? How? How much time is left on the light? All these factors factor into this uh, th- these intersection accidents, and so looking at these types of um, these solutions that they're offering is pretty cool. One thing that I, I I'm surprised they didn't hit on because this has a like a, a large implication like outside of just you know your normal cyclists or people that are you know using kind of autonomous vehicles or even just people walking, but thinking about maybe those that are visually impaired, could these like walk signs and systems give out more information? Cause there, there's a lot of, I know all the crosswalks near me now, they kind of like talk to people. They like let you know what, where the intersections are and like what the name of them are and whether you could cross or not, but maybe it can even give off even more information to those that are visually impaired. Like, Hey, there's a cyclist coming or something, something to that degree. So I feel like the more, that we're able to like kind of like integrate this idea of putting a lot of sensors in places like like intersections that maybe can cut down to some degree on the number of accidents that occur because humans maybe interact erratically or you can't really predict them if you're on you're like riding fast on a bicycle. It's it's a great uh, application of the technology. Yeah, we've seen more and more um, technologies try to address that that visually impaired. Uh, the need for visually in- impaired individuals to get more information about the the world around them, especially when you have really dangerous situations. So I think you know, uh, can you imagine this like plugging into the cane troller um, that we talked about? On oh, the that show? would be amazing. Wouldn't yeah. that be cool? Like you know, it vibrates, letting you know that that the uh, the road ahead is is still has oncoming traffic in both directions. Like, or there's a car about to turn right. You know, like that's something that maybe you could pick up through your senses, but to have an additional feedback mechanism for that thing would be would be awesome um looking at some of these diagrams though it's pretty cool to see like you know uh this example i'm i'm gonna have it thrown up here on the b-roll but uh there's like you know cyclists with bluetooth devices there's a bunch of different information feeding this network hub like a cctv um that feeds into cellular data that's accessed from the cloud and fusion data fusion applications it's it's pretty cool. It's, it's pretty basic at its core, but I mean, just the idea kind of excites me about what we could do with just basic sort of information and how we can improve intersections. 
Well, I think that's the best part about this entire like project, right, or this report is that it's just based on what already exists. We're not adding a whole bunch. Like smart cities is a awesome concept, but a lot of times we're we're adding things in where like the state has to spend a lot more money to update either camera systems or add sensors into the streets. And in this case, we're basically using CCTV and then what exists cellularly, um, and that's that's basically all you need. So that's I don't know. It, it's it's cool because I I think it gives that like proof of concept if any cities like LA or anywhere else are kind of pondering like, Hey, I would, I like this smart city idea to make devices more connected. And then eventually like connecting that to police forces, you know, cars, whatever it may be. It's a good test case. Yeah. I thought one, uh, particularly interesting to me, uh, thing about this report is that they kind of give you this intelligent intersection toolbox. This is chapter five for anyone following along. Um, but they give you a couple tools, uh, for, for algorithm families or families of algorithms, which I thought was really interesting. And I'll go over a couple of them here. Maybe we can talk about them after I, I read them all off. Uh, but we have analysis of intersection geometry to identify possible maneuvers, conflicts, and blind zones. Computation of blind zone activation likelihood, given a traffic pattern and signal timing. Uh, classification of conflicts and blind zones by their importance. Computation of optimal and minimal viable sensor placements in the intersection to ensure desired coverage of blind zones. There's a lot of focus on blind zones, which is really neat. Uh, interpretation of sensor readings to determine traffic presence and dynamics in the blind zones. Uh, signal phase prioritization to ensure safe and efficient passage of different travel modes. And prediction of signal phase duration for adaptive and uh, actuated signals. I feel like number three is going to be like the crux of all of those things. Classification and conflicts of bl- and blind zones by their importance. So I agree. Yeah, because it's, it's a lot to do with not just like am I getting a signal but detecting a specific type of event. So is it is it really a blind zone that's actually dangerous? And then categorizing like, yeah. okay, how do I uh, – is it uh, the person that's coming down the street that's a cyclist that's the problem or do I need to categorize some other event that's going on in a different way to prevent an accident or do I have to let an accident happen to save somebody else? Yeah, I this is – I feel like this is – probably the place where you have to be most careful with algorithmic bias sure um because who's to say that a cyclist's life is more valuable than anyone else or someone in a car that's carrying two or three people maybe maybe an infant in the car is that more valuable than a cyclist like this is the trolley problem and ultimately yeah yeah this is this is the trolley problem and there's going to be a lot of debate uh, over that one for sure um but I mean, if you if you take that one just out of context, in isolation, I guess it is the trolley problem. But you have all these other supporting uh, algorithm families they call them that will help um, alleviate some of that. Right? A lot of these situations can be cut and dry, and in the ambiguous situations, well, then we have to come down one way or the other. But overall, you know, this this intersection will be safer than it would have if we didn't have these algorithms. Oh sure, yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely better with than without. I think it gets we just get stuck as as just a society in general about the kind of trolley problem aspects of the of implementing technology like this because it is not it's no longer a human's choice to make the decisions. It's technically an algorithm or a, like an automated agent is making these decisions for you. And what if it's the wrong one? And then then you get into the whole you know I robot rabbit hole problem. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty cool though. This this report is really neat. They give a lot of examples of intersections that could be improved, um, with neat little diagrams that kind of show how how uh, this might be implemented. Um, but yeah, a super interesting article. And uh, you have anything else on that one? I'm I'm kind of intersectioned autonomous vehicle out. <laughs> We've had too much. I don't know. I just think it's good that this stuff's going to be pushed straight to your smartphone. Because, I mean, then that just allows people that are just walking around the street to maybe be a little more informed. But I, th- I think at the same time, it may be beneficial to kind of find other means to convey the information. Yeah, it's cool. Um, I'm just happy that they're looking at solutions that have technologies currently out there right now, you know. Most definitely. All right. We got one more. This one's fun. What is it? This is so fun. <laughs> so researchers and academics from different disciplines came together to design and test the font called Sans Forgetia. Forgetia? Forget for, yeah, for, I think it's Forgetica. Forgetica. There we are. For, sans Forgetica. I, but I like Sans Forgetcha. Forget That's ya. cool. 
So researchers believe that the font is the world's first typeface specifically designed to help people retain more information. So the font was developed in collaboration between typographic typographic design specialists and psychologists combining psychological theory and design principles to improve retention of written information. It works by using a learning principle called the desirable effect, de- desirable difficulty, where an obstruction is added to the learning process that requires us to put in just a l- enough effort leading to a better memory retention to promote deeper cognitive processing. So Sans Forgetica has varying degrees of distinctiveness, distinctiveness built into into it that subvert many of the design principles normally associated with conventional typography. These degrees of distinctiveness can cause readers to dwell longer on each word, giving the brain more time to engage in deeper cognitive processing to enhance information retention. And Sans Forgetica is available for free to download in your Chrome browser extension at sansforgetica.rmit. How how have we not thought of the fact that this may have been a good idea longer ago by making something harder to do in order to process it more? It's kind of like the QWERTY keyboard over the Dvorak keyboard. It's like yeah. slowing you down for the machine. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I did. You, have you had a chance to look at this font? I'm looking at it right now, and I've learned so much more than I have ever before. It's using just all principles to kind of make your brain kind of fill in these missing pieces of this font, which makes you work harder to process what it is you're looking at, um, which is interesting. I don't know. I am curious to see how this works and to get more validation on this because anecdotally this is pure anecdote i uh i installed the chrome extension and i'm i'm really trying hard to separate my thoughts on the chrome extension from the font itself because the chrome extension is trash and it's really bad oh he did a good job (laughs) separating that out for everybody (laughs) it's really bad so you know hold on let me just let me just address this here so (laughs) the the way you do it blake is you have to activate the um the Chrome extension, you press the button and then you go and highlight the section that you want to translate to the font. Okay. And yeah. the, the scaling's off, um, you know, and it, it just, it doesn't work the way I want it to. I want to hit the button and have the whole page translate. Well, maybe they'll hear this and they'll know that now. Maybe. I don't know if you're listening, please, please make something that translates the whole page. I don't, I'd be curious to download the actual font. So I didn't do my due diligence and actually download the font and <gasps> write something up or translate a document that I have um, to see if perhaps I would remember something better. Uh, but it'd be cool to actually like read a Kindle in this font. Like yeah. I'd be curious. Or something. Yeah. I'd be curious to see what type of uh, reading comprehension um, you can achieve through the, uh, through the app. Because something to notice, like, or something to note. For those of you not watching on YouTube, please go watch it on YouTube. But if you're not, like, basically this font looks like, if you've ever seen these, it's like a stencil for letters. Kind of. It's almost what it looks like. Yeah. It looks like almost a spray paint stencil for letters where you have those like, little gaps and spaces in between the full letter itself. And so your brain is basically filling in that space. Uh, it's it's similar to the idea, I know this is some some kind of psychological effect that I've forgotten the name of, but it's similar to when you re- if you read what looks like a line of nonsense kind of text, but there's enough in there to you for your brain to make up what the actual sentence is. People are screaming at their phones right oh, now. I'm sure they're they like, are. Blake, it's this a- thing. Yeah, I know. I should I should just Google it, but I'm not going to. I'd rather yell at me in our Slack. Come join yeah, us on come, Slack. Hey, Human look, that's Factors a cast. great plug for Slack. Um, just yell at Blake there. Yeah, but I, I'm actually interested to try this reading because I've had a very hard time getting away from books and being able to read stuff either on Kindle or on my phone through like the Kindle app or whatever, any, any kind of, you know, software that allows you to read books on your phone uh, and staying engaged and then feeling like I'm actually retaining a lot of the information. There's something still for me that the electronic version of reading just doesn't do it as well as like a physical method. So I'd love to try this out in my own brain and see if it makes any difference in terms of my processing over time. Oh my God. I hate this Chrome extension. It's so bad. Hang on, I'm trying an experiment right now. Okay. Uh, if if we can get this Chrome extension to work, I'm gonna highlight uh, a thing and I'll recall it at the end to see if we can remember what it was. Um, but I can't get the thing to work. So fix your app. 
fix your Chrome extension. This is bad. So just just a little more about, about how they actually went about doing this. I'll read some of the methods that we have. So roughly about 400 Australian university students participated in a laboratory and online experiment conducted by RMIT. Uh, where the fonts with a range of obstructions were tested to determine which led to the best memory retention. So that is the name of the game here with Sans Forgetica is memory retention over time, right? So they broke just enough design principles without becoming too illegible and aided in memory retention, which is kind of funny because it's like you have to go against so much of the grain of what we consider best practices and design principles, and it created a font that actually is a little bit better for you. Okay, so Maybe. update, update. I got this thing to work but only for a split second, and then it went away after I had got it to work, which I don't understand why that would happen. I just... Uh, it just this wants is you to frustrating. read fast. This is, is this designed to frustrate the user? Because this is bad. This is really bad. Nick is doing a heuristic evaluation. First ever on uh, Human Factors cast. Okay, again, I'm going to try to separate the font from the bad, bad chrome extension yeah yeah do it. uh there's you a lot it. of one star reviews so i'm not alone there um can you get it to work are you trying to get it to work i'm trying to do it okay uh yes i think this font is cool i would uh, to be fair i haven't tried it out in its full sort of uh capacity and, and use case i would like you blake i want to go and read um read a study with this you turned on you know that would be good for like uh if we could get one prior to the show and read through it and determine, like, okay, did reading through that actually turn out to give us more information about the story? Did we do, like, a better job presenting the story based on the font that we read it in? Sure. That'd be kind of cool to do. Yeah, I mean, maybe, because it, it would require more work on our part uh, cognitively, not not necessarily in show note preparation or whatever. Sure, but, yeah. But uh, cognitively, it'd require a little bit more of our attention to go through and read these uh these articles try to fill in all the blanks i don't know you can you can keep trying to do that but uh i'll tell you what the process is not that great already yeah i'm a believer (laughs) all right uh you know what though blake i'm gonna go ahead and move ahead to the next part of the show oh do it it came from it came from all right yeah i'm switching gears we're getting to it came from reddit this is the part of the show where we search all over reddit or anywhere really we could do twitter we could do uh slack Whatever. Do, uh, you know, yeah. What, a, what a, as long as it uh, encourages, uh, you know, discussion in the community of human factors. It's, uh, man, I've really forgotten how to podcast. <laughs> it's weird. You All right. Got it. Any subreddit's fair game, as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion among the community. Blake, we have, uh, what, two, three up here? What is it? Two, two. Which, um, which one? Do you, what do you got? Is that what's what's playing? Oh, uh, the Sans Forgetica stuff is playing. Oh, in the my Sans Forgetica. All right. Anyway, that what do you want to do? One or two? What do you want to do? One or two? Uh, let's do two. We're doing two. All right. Uh, so number two here. This is posted by Bu Zaxis. I'm gonna mess that up. Um, and this is from the uh, the user experience subreddit. This is what is your process for synthesizing user interviews? They go on to write, I am trying to understand and solidify how to best extract meaningful data out of user interviews, and good luck. Is is there a set process you and your team follows to organize and extract useful data out of user interviews? If so, can you please describe it? Uh, Do you find the process effective? Blake. That's hilarious. I'm going to throw it over to you first. That's fine, yeah. (laughs) I just love that you laughed so hard. So, I mean, the best way you can get good information out of user interviews, the only way that I know how to get great information out of a user interview that is useful um, is a lot of preparation beforehand. If you kind of like throw together some kind of interview that is not well structured, it doesn't get at, you know, what the whatever the problems are that you're trying to address either through design or from a business perspective, you're just going to get bad data from people. Um, So upfront work is the best way to prepare and be ready to synthesize what you get out of it. Um, but in terms of like, what do you what do you do afterwards? So I did the work. I created a good user interview. Um, I actually asked the same questions to all the people that I was talking to. That's hey, always that's an important really one. important. Uh, and I didn't get off on too many tangents inside of it. Uh, usually, it's distilling that information down and looking for trends. So that can be the hard part, right? So you hopefully you've either recorded the interviews or you've taken diligent notes, and maybe you only then paid attention to exactly what you needed. 
But from my perspective, it's it's kind of just a lot of work of trying to almost make the data tell you something you didn't know before. And hopefully you're, you either talk to enough people the way you can get a diverse set of opinions, but in some way that lead to some sort of trend. Or you've asked enough questions to the right small amount of users that you can see trends within. But Nick, what do you think? I mean, what, how, it sounds like you've had some tough experiences getting a user interview data to be very reliable or easy to use. Uh, It's not necessarily the reliability or the ease of use. I guess it could be ease of use. I don't know. I've tried various methods where like you, you take transcriptions of these interviews and tag them. You go through the transcriptions and have other coders tag them with like thematic, uh, themes yeah and and uh then you run some sort of extractor on these themes and you kind of see like oh this was mentioned x amount of times and you can kind of quantify uh the the uh, user interview I, it, it kind of depends on what data you're after right if you're after that qualitative what do people think about this thing um this is great and and the the hmm trying to figure out how to analyze it is the worst part, right? Or the best part if you're a data nerd like me. Because for me, I I love trying to force things into buckets. Uh, and I think we all do as, as humans. I think, you know, to some degree, we want things to fit in a certain way, but it doesn't always. And so there's, like I said, you can do the, the like, uh, the, the tagging, extracting themes. You can also sort of, um, report just at a high level what were some themes it, it all comes down to kind of that thematic breakdown of this is what people were saying um, but if you can add that quantifiable information to it like hey this was brought up 17 times during you know our eight interviews uh, well that's twice a person uh, on average you know so I don't know it's it's tricky beast um, you know what I've kind of found helpful with a lot of the like UX students that I work with through the like program that I teach for is the most useful thing that I've seen in terms of trying to understand from a qualitative perspective, what's going on from a user interview or the outcomes from like a a survey at the end of a usability test, or even doing a user needs analysis is using kind of an affinity map. So taking a lot of those, a lot of those pieces of information that you heard from each participant and to the best you can, seeing if anything aligns. And so that gives you that perspective of like, how many times did I hear this? How severe of a problem really is what user one and two said versus what five, six, seven, and eight had to tell me. Right. Um, So I feel like there's, there's good ways to be able to find ways to quantify it. But a lot of times I think it's based on like what qualitative information are you really looking for? Yeah. Uh, And did you do enough upfront work to, you know, structure the questions that are actually getting you towards an answer of, do Mm -hmm. I understand my user population? Does my product work? And that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 I don't don't feel like that's necessarily the answer this person's looking for, but that's, that's the most effective way I know to tackle this. I don't know. Good all human factors cast, uh, Given given half-assed answers, it depends. <laughs> it depends. It depends. Hey, look at that, uh, Blake. Before we go, I want to Do you like read books. What? <laughs> <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Stop. Uh, no. Before we go, I want to uh, thank all of our listeners again for listening to our bonus HFES coverage. I know some of you expressed concern with the fact that we are only releasing a bunch of interviews during this process. Well, we have a treat for you. Uh, we have one more bonus episode that we wanted to kind of sit on for a little bit so blake you and i recorded this and we'll say this in the bonus episode too but we recorded this on a wednesday night it was um i guess what three days into the conference and and, yeah we uh, had like one more one more real day left right and so it was you me uh woodrow who's been on the show a couple times and we had a couple others in the room logan who you've heard on the show and one of our volunteers from hfes bailey uh and and we kind of all sat down to kind of do this round table of um you know what what happened at the conference and and how people were feeling about it and what things they found exciting and interesting and highlights lowlights all that stuff so i just want to thank uh our panel for for doing that with us and um you can look forward to that in your feeds uh it is more in line with kind of the the bonus episodes that we've done before um and i will say you know it is kind of chopped up because 
let's just say there were a lot of tangents that night. It wasn't all about HFES. We talked about Amazon drones or whatever too, but uh, I just want to love just that conversation. Yeah. So (laughs) human factors, engineers, and what does it mean to be an engineer? So all that stuff was talked about, but I just want to let you guys all know that that will be dropping in your feed right after this one. Uh, And with that, Blake, do you have anything else to say? I'm really excited for people to react to that episode because that is the, that is the feedback we basically have gotten thus far is like it was great for you guys to do interviews, but where was like the normal coverage, the content right. that we've come to like, which is funny because that's the DIY stuff we were doing. Yeah, it was like one of us gets to go to the conference because that's the only one that like for HFES had a job right. at the time that could go, and so it it's it's great to hear that feedback, and I hope that you enjoy that this other bonus episode because it's got a lot of diverse perspectives. Yes, it does. All right. Well, that's going to be it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. If you're a Patreon supporter, stay tuned for the after show. For the rest of you, uh, like I said, we got a bonus episode coming from HFES coming your way way right after this. Uh, If you want to stay in touch, you can follow us uh, on the discussion on our Slack or follow us all over social media channels at HFactors Podcast. If you like what you hear and want to support the show, you can... You know what? Don't even do that. I want you to go and take this... Uh, this survey that I put in the show notes. This is really, really important to us. Uh, With all the bonus interviews, we want to know what was effective and what was not. So go do that. Uh, But then you can leave us a review. Uh, And, you know, if you're really generous, you can support us on Patreon too, or you can consider it. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Blake Garnstorff for hanging out with me on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you? Oh, you guys can always find me across social media at Don't Panic UX. All right. Special thanks to Jeff Olson for our our video editing and super special thanks to Jeff Olson for all of our video editing over HFES. That was a lot of so many videos, a lot of videos. He pumped them out really quick. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Please take that survey Uh, until next time. It it depends. Take the survey and it depends. Just do it. Take that survey because it's really important. Please. It'll take you. It'll take you like three minutes. Literally, it's it's right in the description below. I know you're still listening. Please just click on the little link right below, and uh, it's it's three minutes. It will really help us out. Thank you. Thank you.